something I could say would take your love away. No place I can go where your love won't be there. Nothing I can do will make you love me more. Your love comes as a gift. And I only have to open it I receive As a gift, as a gift, and I only have to open it. Yes, I receive your everlasting love for me. I receive your everlasting love for me. I receive the Lord. I receive. Jesus. Lord, we open up our hearts to you to receive whatever you have for us tonight, Lord, to give you glory, to praise your name. Oh, you're a great and wonderful Savior. You're a great and wonderful God. We worship you, oh Lord. We magnify you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. All your promises are yes and amen. your name. Your words are true. Your mercy does not change. All your promises are precious. Reviving our faith. Every one of them will be fulfilled one day. Oh, all your promises are yes and amen. Jesus, your promises are true. Yeah. 
my foot it almost slipped oh lord i almost lost my way till one day i entered the house of the lord and i heard your sweet spirit say all your promises are yes and amen jesus your promises are true But it almost slipped Oh God I almost lost my way Oh, till one day I entered the house of the Lord And I heard you I heard your spirit say All your promises are yes And amen, Jesus Your promises are true Yes, they are All your promises are yes
just puts a, a spring in my step, a dance in my feet, a smile on my face. Oh, we're celebrating you, Jesus. We're celebrating your resurrection. We're celebrating your blood. Hallelujah. Sing it with me. Yeah. I will praise Jehovah. He's the God that provides. Tambourines and dance and sing. Cymbals, trumpets, tambourines and dancing. Oh, yeah. Everything with breath can praise the Lord. It's a kingdom celebration. It's a kingdom celebration. Let the high praises ring. We will sing with our creation.
I will worship you. up as we go, but I feel like this is what the Lord wants to hear right now. I want the men to sing. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Come on, man, sing it. 
Singing, man. I'll, ladies, sing.
to find the place of rest, the place of peace. Jesus, and I am looking for all the time to steal away. You've walked into this place, the Lord says, without peace. You've walked into this place with your spirit troubled. You've walked into this place broken. You've walked into this place with years of hurts and baggage. If you allow the Father to pour over you right now, if you'll open up your spirit, take down all the safeguards and realize that there's no one here to hurt you. The Holy Spirit is here to touch you. The Creator, the God that created you is here to heal you. The God that made you and formed you from the dust of the earth is here to fix you because He loves you. You won't leave here the same if you just take down, take down the walls. Take down the walls. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you, Jesus. Send your healing, Lord. Send your healing, Lord. Send your healing, Lord. Send your healing, Lord. Send your healing, Jesus. Hey, he's doing it. He's doing it. <laughs> Yeah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord, for deliverance. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you, Lord, because we can be free. We can be free because of your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Woo! We can be free. Jesus.
Do it, Lord. Send your healing, Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord's not finished. He's not finished. I'm changing songs, but he's not finished. There's some people here who've come here broken. The Holy Spirit's speaking to you tonight. He's going to change you in this place. And it's all because of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Tell me what can wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's not a good that I. I've just felt prompted of the Holy Spirit to tell you. In the early 1900s in this country, Azusa Street was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What a lot of Americans didn't realize was across the waters in Sunderland, England, God was doing something simultaneously. With Smith Wigglesworth in Sunderland, England, and the great outpouring that God was doing. And you know when the healings and the miracles and the deliverance would happen? When they start singing about the blood. So... If you could just take off your religion and, and just not be entertained for the next few minutes, forget about that church entertainment. If you walked into this place and you need healing and you need deliverance, you need God to touch you while we're singing the blood of Jesus, I want you to just accept it and let God move. He's here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when the bridegroom cometh, will your soul be white? Pure and white in the blood of the Lamb Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright? Are you washed in the blood? Come on, sing it! Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul? Yeah! 
blood of Jesus. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Oh, bless you, Lord. Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. You need to lift your voice right now and praise Him. Come on, lift up your voice. Let's worship the Lord.
name. Glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. Oh, hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah! Bless you, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. oh yes, Lord. Wonderful. You're the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain. You ascended heaven, and evermore will reign. At the end of the age, when the earth you reclaim, you will gather the nations before you. And the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who was crucified. For with wisdom and mercy and justice you reign at your father. And the angels will cry, Everlast. Who was slain for the world? Who lived And the earth will reply, You shall reign. Yes, you will. As the King of all kings and the myself a minute. You see, there's a shield in our hands, and there's a sword in our sides. There's a fire in our spirit that cannot be denied. As the Father has told us, for these you have died, for the nations that gather before you. And the ears of all men need to hear of the Lamb who was crucified. We descended to Yet was raised up to reign at your father's side, and the angels will cry. we 
He's coming again. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming. He's coming again. Jesus is coming again. Sing it again. Jesus is coming. He's coming again. Jesus is coming again. Sing it. Jesus is coming. He's coming again. Jesus is coming. Just as he went, he'll come back in a cloud. Jesus is coming again. We'll hear the sound of the trumpet loud. Jesus is hey. coming again. Heavenly warriors and angels of praise. Jesus is coming again. We'll tell of his glory that triumph day. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming, he's coming again. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming, he's coming again. Jesus is coming again. Come on, say it again, Jesus. Jesus is coming, he's coming again. The groom is preparing a place for his bride. Jesus is coming again. Therefore, eternity close by his side. Jesus is coming again. He's awaiting the words that his father will say. Jesus is coming again. Go get your bride for the weddings today. every sin that does so easily beset us Lord we lay aside the love of this world Lord we lay aside Lord the love of things and the love of family more than we love you Jesus you're our passion and you're who we want to see we don't want to see another great preacher or another great singer or another great church we want to see your church rise Lord we want to see your face and you said you didn't leave us here forever because the groom is preparing a place for his bride. Jesus is coming oh, no. You know what? For eternity, Lord, we're going to be close by your side. Jesus is coming again. Awaiting the words that your father will say. Jesus is coming again. Go get your bride because the wedding
And we say yes, Lord. We will stand up and fight. We will ride with the armies of heaven. We'll be just in white. We say yes, Lord. his love for his bride and he's longing that she be with him right by his side that fire in his eyes is his burning desire that his bride be with him and I'm gonna be right by your side but he's calling out to us tonight saying will you ride with me just lift up your voice and say Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I will ride with you. Sing it, church. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, my soul says yes, Lord. Church, lift your voice up. Lift your voice up. Sing it to the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Well, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. Glory! Praise the Lamb of God. Praise the Lamb of God. You know, I just feel in my spirit that this week is the week of deliverance for many people here. Monday, we started getting phone calls in to the office. People calling, people wanting appointments, people coming in with depression and and just uh, all kind of junk hanging on them. And, and um, uh, those, those few calls that we got are just indicative of the numbers that come. And um, I, I just, as I was receiving those calls and hearing the desperation in the voices of those people that we saw and from out of town and those uh, that, that call that were coming into town saying that they were coming here because they, they needed something from God. And uh, in, in most cases, it was in the area of things that, that have holes in their lives. And friends, we don't believe in demon possession here of Christians. Uh, we don't believe that's possible, but I'm gonna tell you, hell is working a heyday in the life of believers on this day and age. And uh, uh, I just want you to know tonight that there are no secrets to deliverance. That's an in vogue word in this day and age, and everybody's coming, they want somebody to lay hands on them, and the problem just go away like that. A problem that's been created over months and years of habits and lifestyles and uh, grooves that have been cut, ruts that have been cut in our lives. And uh, we want somebody to lay hands on us and just suddenly that go away. But uh, I'm going to tell you how deliverance comes in most cases, I believe. I believe deliverance really comes to us when we put ourselves in obedience to the Word of God. It isn't some magical prayer. It's just simply obeying the Word of God. And as we begin to obey, what happens is the shackles begin to fall off of us because the Word of God is sharp and quicker than any two-edged sword. (laughs) 
If you're here tonight and you, you've come here for deliverance and, uh, and you want God to release you from something in your life, some life-controlling thing, it may be lust or pornography or uh, uh, some uh, addictive thing that you have like alcohol or drugs, and that may be controlling your life, let me just say to you tonight, just make up your mind. You see, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He's just like the wind. He blows this way and blows that way. But if our hearts are not divided and our hearts are in love with God and we've made up our mind that we are his, uh, his servant, we've given up all rights to our lives and we'll set ourselves in obedience to the word of God, I want you to know that the shackles will begin to fall off our lives and we'll be free like we've never been free before. And I have to tell you that one of the greatest bondages that, that we, we see in people's lives here is the bondage of religion. I'm going to tell you it's a damnable thing because what it does is it gives the one a false sense of security. You see the Pharisees, and, and uh, Steve mentioned in a message the other night, our, our pastor mentioned it in his message Sunday. And, uh, and, and Jesus was talking to them about the bondage they were in. They said, we're Abraham's seed. We're in bondage to no man. And they were denying, their, we've, they said we've never been in bondage. They were denying their past. They had been in bondage. They had been in bondage for 400 years or more down in Egypt. And they hadn't forgotten that. They knew that. Some of their festivals revolved around the deliverance of, of that nation from the children of Israel. And yet they said we've never been in bondage. You see, it's a religious mindset, friend. And that thing can bind you where you are so that God, even though he has the power and the ability and the want to, to set us free, he can't do it. Because we've, I, I know because when I came here, I'm going to tell you, I was bound with religion. You know, you can get trained and you can learn how to do it. And one of the greatest uh, resources and strength that God puts in us preachers is also our Achilles heel. And I'm going to tell you what it is. It's the power of our personalities and the ability to control. And you see, in my life, the bondage was that I was a controller. And uh, nothing, nothing was going to happen. Nothing was going to happen unless I permitted it to happen. And uh, the truth of the matter was that because I had that mindset, not much was happening. Not much was happening. And so the first thing God did to me was, so people are always wondering, well, why do you fall down? Well, one reason you fall down around here is if you can't stand up, you don't have many options. <laughs> but I, I, you know, and, and I fell down because I couldn't stand up, and I wasn't into that. But I, I truly believe that sometimes the reason we can't stand up and the reason God just takes our strength away is to take that sense of control away from us. So that God is finally saying, you're not in, really in control. You are the createe, not the creator. You are the createe. And uh, that's what God did in me. And, when, and, and it wasn't an easy thing. It was a process. But uh, when God completed that process, and I guess he's still probably working on that to, to some degree right now. But when God brought that to the degree where he could begin to move in my life, then things began to happen. And until God brought me to that place, nothing could happen because I was in control. And so tonight, if you're here and, and there's something in your life that is controlling your life, and you're, you're depressed, there's a cloud over you, uh, why don't you just, um, just give it all up? Just say, Lord, you are the master and I am the servant. I have no rights. I have no privilege. I throw myself totally, completely on your mercy. I give up all rights, and I set myself in total agreement to everything you've said and everything that you want to do, contrary to my thinking, contrary to my training. I just give it up, and I'm going to trust you, Lord, in this minute. And, friend, I believe that if we can do that, we'll see the power of God fall in this place, and, and life-controlling situations will go in a heartbeat. They'll go in a heartbeat. And they'll stop some of us from being on this spiritual roller coaster we find ourselves on. Up one time, down the next, you know. Get in the right meeting, we get goosebumps and we feel so wonderful. And then we get out there and suddenly we wonder where God is. Did he fall off the throne or, or did he leave the universe or where is God? Well, God's right where he's always been. Smack dab in the middle of this thing, friend. And he's in control, I'm telling you right now. Nothing surprises him.
Nothing surprises him. No need ever catches him unaware or unprepared. Any need that you've brought into this building tonight, I want you to know that God has already placed the resources to meet that need in his vast storehouse of eternity. And it's there available to us tonight. And we can draw on that without, and, and when we draw on it, we don't deplete the resource that he has provided. There's just as much there left after we've drawn our, our needs from there as there was before we tapped that resource. That's the way God is, inexhaustible. And so I just encourage you tonight, just make up your mind, get, a, get in obedience to God, lay down the other stuff. When Steve gives the altar call tonight, if there are things in your life that need to be gotten out, just get it out. Just come on down. Take your defenses down. Don't get mad at him for preaching the word. Don't get mad at the Holy Spirit for speaking to your heart and slipping a few arrows through you. Just, just say, hey, I needed that. And, uh, and come on down and get in this crimson flow and let God just clean it up. And I'm telling you, friend, you won't know freedom like you've ever known like that freedom. You've never known it like that before. Praise God. I just felt a need to say that tonight. Normally, I don't do those kinds of things, but I did tonight. That sermon did not cost you a dime. You may be seated. Well, how many of you believe in the hereafter? Okay. Well, let me tell you what I'm here after. I'm here after an offering, okay? Every seat in the house is free. There's no charge to get in the door, no charge for your seat. If you don't have any money, you're just as welcome here than, as anyone else that may... Uh, be rolling in dough. This revival is not about money, yet it takes money to pay the bills. It'd be wonderful if uh, Gulf Power, who furnishes our electricity, would let us come down and uh, lay hands on the president and pray the prayer of faith over him and give him a good blessing. And uh, he would take our bill and say, well, that was great. We'll just cancel your light bill. But unfortunately, he won't do that. He wants money. And uh, so it is with everything that goes on around here. It just takes money. And you see, God, uh, he could supply the money himself. But God's given you and me the wonderful opportunity and privilege of being channels through which he can supply the money. And, uh, you know, God could turn this pulpit into gold. And every time we had a bill, God would say, just solve a piece right over here. Take it down and pay your bills. And we'd be able to do that. If with this pulpit was gold, I guarantee you we could pay all of our bills. But uh, God doesn't do it like that. The way God does it is that God blesses the people of God and then says, now you be a good steward. And when I ask you for some of that back, then be faithful and, and give, give some back. And I've been in meetings like this before and had no intention whatsoever of giving in the offering. I might have some money in my pocket, but uh, my attitude would have been at that particular time, well, I paid my tithes back in the local church and... Um, so I'm in this meeting, and uh, really, I don't think I'm going to give anything tonight. And right out of the clear blue, God would speak to me. And invariably, when I get a mindset like that, God really taps my resources. He really does. In fact, I was um, at, a, at a church one time in this city years ago uh, when I was a Navy chaplain. I was there to preach a homecoming. And how many of you know when a preacher goes to a church to preach, he is supposed to receive an offering? He's supposed to receive an offering from the church for himself. And uh, so it was one of those times when the guy got up and said, you know, we're going to receive an offering. And would you believe with that mindset that I had that God just tapped me for a little giving right then. And he said, you give this church $1,000. And I said to God, I said, well, um, two things. Number one, I'm here to receive an offering, not give an offering. I am the speaker here. And the way this works, Lord, is that when you're invited to a church to speak, <laughs> you will be blessed by that church with an honorarium. And that is part of the process here. So I want to get that straight. And secondly, I don't have $1,000. And uh, God reminded me as I sat there, and, and, and it, did, it didn't take God but about a minute to do this, 30 seconds probably. And he said, um, well, you have preached before, and you thought you were going to get an honorarium, and you didn't get anything, and this just may be one of those instances. <laughs> and he said, besides that, you do have $1,000. And uh, I said, no, Lord, I don't have $1,000. And he said, um, you have $1,000. You have more than $1,000. It's in savings. And I said, well, Lord, yeah, I, yeah, I do have $1,000 in savings. And, and, you know, I have more than $1,000 in savings, but 
you know, I've been dragging my wife all over the world, and uh, I want to buy her a house when we re retire from the Navy, so I'm saving for that house. And God said to me, well, who gave you the money that you have in your savings account? Well, you did, because I truly believe it's God that gives us the power to get wealth. It's not our intelligence, our ability, or our energy. It's God who gives us the power to get wealth, because if he took his hand off of us, we wouldn't have enough mentality to tie our shoes. And so he said, um, well, uh, he said, um, uh, whose money is that? Is it yours or mine? Well, my wife and I had made up our mind years ago that everything we had was the Lord's. So I said, well, I, it's yours, Lord. And so he said, well, if I want to give a thousand of my money, then is that okay with you? <laughs> so, I mean, how do you argue with that? Listen, friend, you can't out-argue God. If God speaks to you tonight, and he'll speak to some of you just like he spoke to me. And uh, you'll sit there and you'll debate God. But I'm going to tell you, you will not win. You may disobey, but you will not win the argument. Okay? And uh, I'm going to tell you, I gave, I gave the $1,000. Uh, I didn't talk to my wife or anything. Normally I do because she writes the checks. I just got up and said, I, I don't know what this is about, but God spoke to me to give this church $1,000. So Shirley, write out a check. And uh, pastor, do not cash it until we can get back uh, to the uh, Navy Federal Credit Union and transfer some money. And did you know that within just a few minutes, people started sta standing up all over that building, and this church had just been constructed, and they were trying to pay for the pews in that building, and they paid for those pews that morning. Now, I didn't know anything about that when I gave that $1,000, but I'm just telling you, that's the way God works. That's God's plan, and when we obey God's plan and we do what God wants us to do, uh, then, then we're blessed. And I'm not setting myself up as an example because I just told you that I flat out argued with God. But when you argue with God, you always lose. You may disobey, but you will always lose the argument. Because when God wants you to do something, He wants you to do it. And there's a reason. So I just want you to listen to God and let Him speak to your voice tonight. I know you've paid uh, to get here from all over the world. I know that you're paying motel bills to stay here. I know that when you go to the restaurant, you don't bless the cashier and walk out. You leave money. And I understand that. You leave money on the table as tips. All of those things. But you know what? When we take vacations and we go places, we don't gripe and complain about paying our way there. But somehow when we get to church, we think, well, you know, this is church. We shouldn't have to do this here. But it's, um, it's really necessary that we have necessary funds in order to pay the bills. Now, if you're here from another church, uh, while our ushers come, if you're here from another church, someplace in the country or the world, let me say to you point blank, do not pay your tithe into this offering. Do not put your tithe in this offering. Your tithe goes into the church of which you are a member. Okay? And all the pastors said? Amen. Amen. You say, well, I don't like my pastor. Well, it doesn't matter whether you like your pastor or not. The question is, do you love God? And do you obey God? You don't give because you're a pastor. You give in spite of him. Okay? And so take your tithe home and put it in your local church. But this is an offering. And I'm going to tell you, friends, when you sow seed, if you're a farmer, you're going to look for the most fertile soil and the best environment you can find to put that seed into. And I want to tell you, this, this, the soil of this revival is fertile soil. There have been over 300,000 people come forward in this altar. You're, you'll see it tonight. They'll be up the aisles. It is absolutely fertile soil. And we have to pay bills here. Thank God for the Brownsville folks that have been so faithful to commit extra money. All of us here at Brownsville, we've committed extra funds for this revival. We plan it. And we've been going on now almost three years now, you see. We're well into our third year. And we had to, we, some of us had to make up our mind about finances, and, and we have. And we ask you to come along beside us and stand with us in paying the bills. Because uh, not only is this blessing Brownsville and Pensacola, but it's blessing the whole world. This blessing the whole world. And so, would you listen to the voice of God tonight and sow some good seed into good fertile soil, and we'll see a bumper harvest come forth. Would you do that? Everyone bow your hearts with me, please. Jesus, we thank you tonight for the blessings we've already received. God, you have poured your Spirit out upon us already. Your Spirit has witnessed with ours that we're the children of God. And if we're children, we're heirs and joint heirs. We've been blessed exceedingly and abundantly above that we could ask or think. 
And Lord, I pray your blessings upon your people now as they put themselves into obedience to you. You know what the bills are for this night. You told us in your word, pray this way. Pray, give us this day our daily bread. And so, Lord, we pray for the daily bread, for this revival, for this night. And, Lord, I believe that you will speak to hearts and lives in this room. And those hearts and lives will be in obedience to you. I thank you for that right now. I thank you because what will be given tonight will be sufficient to meet the need by faith. And I ask this in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Bless the Lord. You know, I was thinking tonight during the service and getting ready to come in, the enthusiasm that we have to be in these meetings night in, night out. I was uh, in the back, a uh, reporter was just asking me a quick question after doing an interview with some of the other leaders, and I heard the music start, and as soon as we were done with the question, I wanted to shoot out so as not to miss a moment of the meeting. I was in Chicago and uh, unable to arrange things to get back in time for a Wednesday night service and 11 o'clock at night, you know, just arriving 11.26 and thinking, man, missing service, missing church. You might think, well, how does everybody feel? It's been going on a long time. People have got responsibilities. People are weary. People are worn out. Do you ever think, man, I wish I could take a night off? No, we don't think like that. We don't think, oh man, church again. No, it's like you can't wait to get to be there, to meet with God, to worship, to see what he's going to do. I want to tell you something else, especially for all those in ministry. You know, we have different folks with different ministry background, but if, you hear, if you're here on Sunday and you hear Pastor Kilpatrick preach, He's a tremendous preacher of the word. And different ones of us, Kerry Robertson that just shared, he's on his way. Soon he'll be ministering to leaders in another country. Day in, day out, bringing a word from the Lord. All of us come from backgrounds where we're on the road, we're doing the major preaching or the major meeting. And we come in every night and we can't wait to hear the word preached. There's not a single time where I think, oh man, I got to hear another message. Now listen. I understand that in some of the churches where you go, that's how you feel, and I'd feel the same. And some of you that are preaching, that's how you feel. You know, i got to preach another message. But friends, when God is moving and the Word is alive, you're just hungry, you're just thirsty. It's not a rigor. It's not a battle. And I want to say something. I want to challenge each of you. See, God's drawing us in, but it's not so he draws us in that we can reach a new level of this is the status quo, this is the norm, this is what we get used to. We could tell you stories that would cause your hair to stand on it. In fact, I'm going to go out and say it, Steve. I've never said this, but some of the stories we could tell you are so unbelievable that even if you're bald, it would cause your hair to stand on it. 
I'm glad I said that. I feel good having said that. I mean, the stuff we hear, I, I, I was sitting with a, with a student one day in, just, uh, in, in another state, and uh, he was just asking me some questions about what's happening in the revival. I just broke down crying, sharing it with him. It happens constantly because of the awesome things that we've seen God do. But we are desperately hungry to see him do more and desperately hungry to know him better and desperately hungry to serve him more effectively and desperately hungry to see him shake this world and glorify his son and take us in deeper. Listen, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you wherever it is that God has brought you, let that be a launching place for more. Let it be a place that gets you with deeper faith, deeper commitment, deeper desire so you can press in after more of God. Don't say, now we've arrived. This is wonderful. Say, God, this is awesome, but it makes me know there's so much more you can do. You know, after the... After the wedding, do you kiss the bride and then say, let's have a great life, see you, see you, and you're off? Or is that the beginning of a life of getting closer and more intimate? Friends, I want you to look at your own life and ask a question, a simple question. Yes, you're blessed. Yes, God's moving. Yes, God's touching many of you. Yes, some of you don't know what to do with the blessing. There's so much happening. And we're in the midst of that. We have a two-year school of ministry. God spoke to us to raise up a school we started in January of last year with 120 full-time students. We now have 706 full-time students. We're overwhelmed with what God is doing. And maybe you're in that kind of situation. Maybe you're in a situation where your church is blessed or your personal life is blessed and overflowing. But look at the Word. Look at God. Look at your own life and ask yourself a question. Is this it? Is this everything? Is this all there is? I believe God's looking at each and every one of us. I don't care if you've healed the sick and raised the dead. I don't care if you've preached to 100,000 people at a single time. I don't care if when you go to meet with God, the cloud comes down over your house and all the neighbors stand and say, wow. <laughs> that actually happened to Moses in Exodus, the 33rd chapter. And you know what happened? When he left, his assistant Joshua stayed. He said, I want more. And then after that, Moses prayed, show me your glory. All this has just got me passionately hungry for more. I don't care what your experience has been. God's saying, will you get out of your safety zone? Will you get out of the things that you're used to? And will you press in deeper after God? It may be frustrating. It may bring you to a place of desperation. It may bring you to a place of total dependence on God and absolute humiliation in terms of your own ability to do anything, but that's the place of grace where God comes down and says, let me show you what I can do. I just want to say this last thing. By the way, you get about 11 messages before the message here. But I was uh, on the plane coming back from Chicago on my way into Atlanta, and I, I sat down, a gentleman came and sat down next to me, and it turns out that he's a, a studio drummer, and a musician, and he's got a school of percussion and so on, and we were, we were talking for a while, and, uh, and, and uh, he's a believer. And we were just talking about things. I got saved in 1971. I was, I was uh, playing drums in a rock band and a heavy drug user, and, and there was a whole mindset that we had in those days. You know, the hippie generation. We were going to go for it. There was this whole new world. It was, it was a messed up, sinful vision. But people threw themselves into it. And when I was in the world, I served the devil with reckless abandon. I put every kind of drug in my system. I didn't care what the consequences of things were. I just went for it. That was for sin. That was for something that was destructive. That was for something that couldn't bring any good to this world. And yet I threw myself in. And now we get saved. And now we become white-collar Christians. Conservative Christians. You know, we're just going to be proper, and we're just going to be the salt and the light of the world. It's just as if just having a lovely, happy Christian family is our role. And friends, if I serve the devil the way I did, how much am I going to serve God? What am I going to do for Jesus who shed his blood for me when I was in my wickedness? And I was saying to this guy, you know, 
I hate when I see people just sitting in reserve that are calling themselves children of God and claim to be living in the light of eternity and that are constantly trying to figure, well, should I do this and what are the consequences as opposed to saying, Lord, if it pleases you, if it glorifies you, if it honors you, whatever the cost, whatever the consequences, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. Living as if everything we believe is real. And I say it's about time that we wake up to reality. It's about time that we plumb the depths of the love of God. It's about time that, that we say, God, there's a place that's higher, there's a place that's deeper, and I'm after it. Amy Carmichael, the missionary to India, one of the greatest missionaries in church history, she said, Satan is so much more in earnest than we are. He's buying up the opportunities while we're still counting the cost. Should I? Shouldn't I? Should I? What will happen? And the devil's just throwing himself in and lives are being lost for what? For darkness, for destruction. And God's saying, how about giving me your all for life, for eternal life, for pleasing me? Look at your life, friend, and let God put a deep hunger within you. As we study in the school the lives of people that God used to shake their generations, many of them came out of a personal crisis. Many of them came out of a place of saying there must be more. And they sought God with prayer and fasting and tears, sometimes for years and years and years. But when the breakthrough came, it shook their generation. We're at a place where it's ready to burst in ways that we can't imagine. And who knows, but your faith, your prayer, your going for it, your laying yourself out may make the difference in your community, your city, your country, this generation. Hear that as a word from the Lord. Let me also invite all of you at 11 o'clock tomorrow to be here. Every leader, every leader, leadership team, staff, church staff, those of you in church ministry, spouses of leaders, be sure to be here at 11. And others, you're all welcome to come. This is an open session, but in particular, we're speaking to leaders at 11 o'clock. Would you like to have more grace in your life? Would you like to have more of the blessing of God in your life? More anointing, see God move more powerfully, have open heavens for revival. God's given me a message for tomorrow called humble yourselves. You wish you didn't say amen all the time, did you? It's a key. It's an important key. Pride will get in the way of everything God's going to do. And in fact, I'll be releasing my new book. I haven't told you yet, Steve. I'll be releasing my new book tomorrow, Humility and How I Have Achieved It. And um, that's why I want to teach on this subject. Now, actually, Lendl wrote the book. I'm just promoting his, his book. But let me encourage you to be here at 11. God will meet us. We have great times together every Friday. And if you're in youth ministry, at 10 o'clock over in the youth chapel across the street, you can get with Richard Crisco. This is a super opportunity. He's the youth pastor here doing an incredible job. He's probably with about five, six, seven hundred kids in the chapel across the street right now. If you're in youth ministry, you can get with him at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning in the youth chapel. If you're in children's ministry, you can get with Pastor Van Lane, who does an awesome job with the kids here. That's in this building in the children's chapel at 10. So youth ministers, children's ministers show up at 10. You can be directed where to go. We'll all be together here at 11. And one warning for you, the Thursday night warning. Uh, at some point later on in this service, there will be a flood of hungry young people released into this building, which means if you are tentative about being prayed for, while you are praying about being prayed for tonight, 11 young people will be stepping in front of you to receive prayer, graciously, politely, but stepping in front of you. So we just warn you on Thursdays that this is infested with hungry young people. So make sure if you're going to be prayed for that you make yourself available so someone on the prayer team can pray for you and God can touch you. Would you stand to your feet? Everyone stand, please. Glory. I'm going to take the service early tonight. Um, a lot of times on Wednesday nights we have testimonies, but tonight I really feel we're supposed to go um, right into the message. The Lord spoke to me a minute ago sitting there in that seat that there's some people here that you're reserving something, you're holding back something from God, and I'm just being obedient to the Holy Spirit. That something is going to sap you dry. 
it's going gonna, it's gonna to suck the spiritual life out of you. It can be a little sin that you just can't get, a, get, get rid of. You don't want to get rid of it. You like it. It's just small. It's killing you, friend. I'm telling you ahead of time, it's killing you. Don't, if God is speaking to you about getting your life totally straight with Him, get it straight, the whole thing. Every little situation that's out there, and when this altar call is given in a few minutes, and people ask me all the time, why are you so set on everyone getting right? Because we've gotten so wrong, friend. We've gotten so wrong, it's time to get so right. Without holiness, we're not going to see God in this nation. And I know we have about 30 nations represented here tonight. I'm telling you, wherever you're from, the large groups that, that's here from Switzerland, without holiness, Switzerland's never going to see God come down. I've been through all the back roads of your country. I've been up in the mountains. I've been all through Switzerland. And I'm telling you, without holiness, you can have one of the most beautiful countries on this planet and half the nation go to hell if they don't know God. I'm telling you, friend, you got to get the sin out, the little things. The little things. One of the things that shocked me about Europe when I lived over there is, is the nudity. And it was just common. We couldn't even take our family to the beaches. We lived in Spain. Couldn't take the family to the beach because of nudity, just total nudity. People taking their clothes off, stripping down and, and swimming. And, uh, and you would find that it's weaved it, it, it itself into churches, into thinking. And people would say, well, what's so wrong with that? What's so, what's the big deal? You know? What's so wrong with, with swimming nude? What's so wrong with, with, with me just, it's my life. I can do what I want to. I love God. He created my body. What's so wrong with that? And it's weaved itself into Christendom, friend. And by the grace of God, we're going to weave it back out. And there's other things. Here in the United States of America, we're dealing, we're, friend, we're sitting, we're sitting on a time bomb right here. We're sitting on a prejudice problem that's about to explode in this nation. What happened out in California several years after the Rodney King trial that just exploded there and the, the fires, I walked that city right after that happened. And I walked right where, where Denny was, was pulled from his truck, I believe that was his name, and, and beaten bloody and walked around that area when all the burned out buildings. This is just right after it happened to find out what on earth is making this nation tick. And I was confronted. As soon as I got there, I was confronted. I think a friend of mine that's here tonight, was, he was with me. We are confronted by a group of blacks that came up to us, and he asked me, what are you doing here? And I told him, I said, this is not your city. This is not your land. And I said, let me tell you something else. You don't hate me, and I don't hate you. And I can prove that. If we were little babies, in a crib together. We'd play all day long with toys. We'd look, color didn't matter to us. I'd play with your toys, you'd play with my toys, we'd just have a time in that crib. But through the years, someone has taught you to hate me. He said, but there's a lot of injustice in the world. Grant you that, I grant you that. It's horrible, it's pitiful. But the problem is not us hating one another. That's not gonna, that's not gonna fix it, hating one another. The problem is sin. And I said, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came down. And on the cross, you know, the cross, at the foot of the cross, everyone's the same. And I told this man, at the cross, at the cross, all the walls of partition between Gentiles and Jews, all the races melted at the cross. And he looked at me and I said, you don't hate me, I don't hate you, and you know that's the truth. And he said to me, he goes, next time you're in L.A., he said, you stay at my place. You stay at my place. Friend, but we're living. I asked them. Larry, you remember that? He was there. We're living in a place right now. Look this way. We're living in this nation. I asked him also. He said this could take off any minute now. This place could explode. We're living in a country, friend, that's about to explode. Don't hide. Don't run from it. Don't look at the economy as if everything's on the upswing. Grow up. Just as sure it's on the upswing, tomorrow it'll be on the downswing. Don't live a false life. We're living in a nation where 68% of the nation says it's okay to do whatever you want to in the White House. 
where 20 years ago, I believe it was, or less than that, we took a man and we saw a picture of him with a girl sitting on top of his lap. The man was Gary Hart. And we saw that. And he lost all possibilities of a political career. The nation was abhorred that he was on a boat called Monkey Business with this girl. You remember that? If that happened today, Gary Hart, you could probably be president. Yeah, it'd probably help him out in the ratings. Something's gone wrong in this nation, friend, and it's time to get it right. Everything has slipped its way into our fabric of our society, and it's time to turn it around. And the problem, the problem is not pointing fingers all around. The problem is you got to point your finger inside. You say, Jesus, what is it in me? What's wrong in me? Am I a hypocrite at home? Am I one of those that in church I'll lift my hands and sing Amazing Grace, but I'll cuss my wife out on Monday? Am I one that I'll give an offering in church on Sundays, but on Monday I'm stealing from my local company? What is wrong with me, Jesus? Am I one I'll look at the speed limit sign that says 55, and I gotta go 75. I gotta break the law. But in church, I worship Jesus. I love the Lord. Think about it, friend. There's a lot more to it than meets the eye. So I'm telling you, God told me a few minutes ago, there's some folks that got to get it all out. Do you live like this, Steve? I'm telling you, friend, I live like this. When I sin, when something happens in my life, I get it out immediately. The Bible says if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And there's people on this platform that I have confessed stuff to. As it happened, Mike Brown's one of them. When I spoke evil of another brother one day. And as soon as I spoke evil of another brother. You ever done that? You ever spoke bad about somebody? I did. I spoke evil about another brother. I didn't rip him to shreds. I just spoke something bad about him. And as soon as that happened, a haze came over me. I felt dirty. I felt dirty. And I turned to Mike. I said, Mike, forgive me. Forgive me. Yeah, we live like this, friend. We live like this. Do you turn your head when you're at Walmart and you see a cover of a magazine with a lewd woman on it? Absolutely. All the time. Everywhere I go, I turn my head. Why? Because I don't want anything to stain my wedding garments. I don't want anything to get on me that grieves the Holy Ghost. I want the Lord to be pleased. I want everyone standing, Lindell, I, I want you to sing, this is the year of the favor of the Lord. The power of God's gonna come down in this place tonight, friend. God's gonna move in your life. He's gonna meet your need. Obey the Lord. This is the year of the favor of the Lord. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon you because He has anointed you to preach good news. He has sent you to the poor Bind up the broken hearted To bring freedom to the captive This is our And to release the ones in darkness Anointed us. Because he has anointed us to preach.
you we worship you we love you we love you we love you you found a people Lord that loves you you found a people Lord that will worship you you found a people Lord that will not shrink back Lord we'll go forward Lord we'll march forward Lord you found a people Jesus we love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. I want everyone tonight to um, pray a prayer. We've been praying since Father's Day. Um, we've been asking the Lord to speak to our hearts. I, I know there's a mixture of people here tonight. They're believers, unbelievers. Um, that's okay. Everyone's welcome. We welcome everyone to this revival. For those of you visiting for the first time, how many of this is your first week of revival? Slip up your hand high. Okay, more than half of the congregation. Um, let me tell you, yeah, welcome. Every night, every night is different. Last night was different. Tonight will be different from tomorrow night. Tomorrow night there will be more people here from other areas of the world. Uh, it's, it's just an, it's an awesome thing to watch, friend, because, you know, it's, um, we've never done any advertising, never bought ads in magazines, and have never put up uh, billboards advertising the revival, say, come here, come here, never took out ads on, on the, the thing, never, uh, never advertised on radio and television about the Brownsville revival, uh, because we just believe personally that, um, uh, if there's a fire burning, you know, people are going to hear about it. They're going to, 
And, it's, 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 and that's, that's what's happened here. And I told somebody one time, I've said this several times to reporters, that you can't put up a sign in front of a church that says revival and have 2.2 million people come from all over the world unless something is really going on. Because I want to tell you something, friend, you're smarter than that. See, we've had, we've had CEOs of major corporations come through this place. We've had billionaires, millionaires. We've had senators, congressmen, federal judges have come here. And we've also had people from the streets, prostitutes from right out front. We've had them from all over the world, all walks of life. They come here from everywhere. They've come in on a freight train. You know, one man got saved, he came in on a freight train. Another woman hopped a plane in New York City. Somebody told her in New York that God is in Pensacola. And she came here looking for God. People come and what happens? They come in this place. And I find my, I'm, to me, I, I'm, I'm just a mediocre preacher. Lindell's a good song leader, but people won't spend thousands of dollars to come hear a preacher or come sing songs. That's right. You know, you can buy a tape. They come because God's kissing them. God's touching them. And so if you're here for the first time tonight, I want you to know that. I want you to if, just put everything aside and think about it logically. 2.2 million people. By the time this year is up, if, if, you, if you had a chance to see what we'll see next month, next month is spring break. This place is unbelievable at spring break. I pull my hair out at spring break because they're, they're everywhere. They're like ants. There's no building. We had to put up a tent outside and the city finally said, take the tent down. We had 2,000 people in a tent trying to hold. Every building on the campus was full. Then summer times, worse than spring break. What is that? What is that? What would cause people to come and come here instead of going on a ski trip or come here and instead of going to Disney World, they stop at Pensacola and never make it down to see Mickey? What's going on, friend? The power of God's coming down. He's changing lives. So look at it. You don't have to understand it. Just look at it logically. It's already been recorded in history books. Church history, historians have already put the Brownsville Revival because it's already in its third year. By June, it'll be three solid years. They've already put it in the books as the largest single church revival in the history of America. And if it goes on and on, it'll be the largest church revival in the history of, the, of America, period. Largest revival ever. And that's no feather in our cap, friend. It's just a fact that this just keeps going on. Why? Because God is kissing people. He is touching people. And somehow you made it here. And God's going to touch your life. So whether you're a believer or a non-believer, he's brought you here. And I want everyone to pray with me right now. Everyone out loud, pray this prayer. Whether you believe in God or not. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. I'm going to speak tonight on a subject that uh, I've never spoken on in the revival. Mentioned it several times. Lindell has sung about it. I have spoken around it and I've spoken on it just a little bit, but I've never preached a message on this particular subject. And I know that I know that I know tonight is the night. I believe it was, um, when was it uh, that the power of God fell down? Was it last Saturday or Saturday before that? A couple Saturday nights ago, I shared a word from the Lord that God had given me that Saturday morning. And... Um, the message that was prepared, normally I'll prepare a message every single morning for the revival, which I am um, willing to do every single day. God knows that. But I had prepared a message on two Saturday nights ago. I'd prepared it that Saturday morning for that evening service. The power of God came down. But the Lord had given me a word. How many believe God can speak? <laughs> he can speak to us, friend, and we better listen when he speaks. There are times I will wake up in the morning literally shaking. 
I'm talking about physically shaking, trembling, and get out of bed at five, six, seven o'clock in the morning. My wife is here tonight. She'll testify to you. She knows my lifestyle. Before the revival broke up, I was up at what, three and four every morning, babe? Every single morning, going after God. Way before the revival broke out. That's been my life, all my Christian life. I love getting up and going after God. Always loved that. And so when revival broke out, our time changed a little bit. You don't get home till 1 o'clock in the morning or 1.30. So then, you know, it's hard to get up at 3. And so I'll get up at 5 or 5.30 or 6, but I'll get up. And a lot of times when I get up, the Lord will speak a word to me. And this is a word that he spoke, and it's not just for that Saturday night. It's for tonight. And then I'm going to share a scripture, and we're going to go through the message. And many of you in this place are going to be ready. For Jesus over the last couple of weeks there has been a restlessness in my spirit I mentioned to pastor just the other day that I feel very unsettled I feel like the ground underneath me is shifting I feel as if th something is about to change and the Lord knows I love change I thrive on the unknown I enjoy the uncertainties of life. I'm extremely comfortable when everything, I'm extremely uncomfortable when everything is cookie cutter predictable. I'm going to say that again because some of you love everything cookie cutter predictable. I'm extremely uncomfortable when everything is cookie cutter predictable. Pastor, if you're in a church and you can tell what's going to happen that day, you're in sad shape. I'm telling you where there's no room for God to move because it's all cookie cutter. 15 minute song service, 35 minute message, five minutes announcement. Open the altars for prayer, but if nobody comes in 30 seconds, we're closing the altars, going home and eating roast. Friend, God's sick of that. When the earth begins to shift when I hear roots being pulled out of the ground when I feel the wind on my face blowing me in a new direction I like that over the last several days something has been stirring I can't stop moving around there's something on the horizon and it's something big I can't touch it yet I can't gaze upon it with my eyes but I can feel it it's there and it's moving closer my spirit man is speaking loud and clear he has overridden my carnal nature and is raising his voice I first heard my spirit man 22 years ago the day I became a Christian the Bible says that his spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you're a child of God 22 years ago God's spirit bore witness with my spirit that I was born again well that same spirit is telling me now something is up the Lord would say to everyone in this place, live unsettled. Don't sink too deep in the soil of this earth. Keep your head up and your feet moving. Stay alert. Be sober. The Lord has spoken clearly. I'm coming. The day of my return is at hand. Loose yourself of any ties that bind. If you don't loose yourself, I'll help loose you. Prepare the way in your own heart and then help prepare the way in others. I want no obstacles, says the Lord. I will have no obstructions. I will, I will return for a pilgrim people. Let the church know that the day is approaching. Warn them. Don't wine and dine them. Tell them clearly. Don't mix words. My word, my water is pure. Don't taint it. Make it clear. Let my people know it's about to happen. What is about to occur will change world history. Nothing will remain the same. Let the unbelievers, let the skeptics, let the religious ones know that what they fear the most is about to happen. Every fear known to man will be swallowed by the terror of that day. Fear will overcome fear. Dread will overcome dread. The violent will be overcome by the more violent. My final work is at hand. My spirit's wooing is about to seize. No one will grieve me anymore. 
No one will quench my spirit anymore. No one will resist me anymore. Those days will be over. Let them know that my warm season of grace and mercy will soon turn to a chilling winter of judgment and wrath. The warm days of my wooing will be exchanged for the fiery days of my vengeance, my pleading for the souls of man, the passionate cry of my faithful harvesters, the unselfish service of my holy servants, all the labor, all the charity, all the pain, all the suffering, it will all be over. I have heard the groans of nature. I have heard the midnight cries. My church has been begging my return. My bride has been longing to be with me. The plan of the ages has almost reached fruition. The tree has borne forth its fruit. The fertile soil has yielded the harvest. The planting will stop. The laborers will leave. The sickle will rust. It's almost over. I'm coming back. I will not delay my coming to you. Don't you delay your coming to me. Now that's a word from Jesus for everybody. For everybody. Now you can be in this place tonight and say, I don't believe stuff like that. That's your problem. That ain't my problem. That's your problem. There were people during the days of Wesley that believed he was a lunatic. But he turned England around. If you do church history and you'll study church history and you'll study English history, you'll see that he stayed back a revolution. That if Wesley hadn't hit the scene at the time he hit the scene, England probably would be divided by now. Tormented. Tormented by the demons of hell. Tormented by the, the sins of the world. And Wesley comes on the scene and starts preaching holiness. Living for Jesus. A disciplined life. Methodist. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. I need pastor back. If y'all could go get him, please. I need Lyndall in here too. Lyndall and pastor. Second Peter chapter 3. I'm calling for these men because there's a lot of hell in this place right now. There's a lot of junk in here right now. I can feel it. I can feel it. I can feel it, friend. I can feel it. Some of you are going to battle with this. You're going to fight with this. See, the Bible says that the devil came to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he's a master at it. He came to destroy you. Somebody wants to kill you. Somebody wants to keep you from getting into the fullness of God. Somebody wants to keep you from reaching your inheritance with God. God's plan for you from the very beginning was not for you to live some mediocre life. He has a life in abundance for you. He has a wonderful life for you. I watch the religious people come in this place. Pastor, the hell is fighting me tonight. I need you and Lyndall to just be with me for a few minutes. Hell is fighting this place tonight, friend. But it ain't gonna happen. See, I'm concerned about you. I'm not concerned about me tonight. I'm gonna be fine, friend. I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about you. There's some souls in the balance. Your soul's in the balance. And he brought you here for tonight. Some of you young people that aren't over there in the other service. The reason you're not over there is because God wanted you here tonight. There's hundreds and hundreds over there. Places packed next door in a service. But God had you stay in this service for a reason tonight. Devil, I want to say something to you. You can't stand this subject. You can't stand it because you know it's true. I'm preaching tonight a message entitled, The Day of His Coming. The Day of His Coming. I want to tell you, the devil doesn't know what day it is, but he's got a superficial X out there marked on some calendar. He knows it's coming. He knows the end of the book. 
He knows there's a time where the angel's going to throw him into the lake of fire. He knows there's coming a time where he will end. It's over. Never again will he torment a saint of God. Never again will he cause a young person to fall into drug addiction. There's coming a day where it's going to be over. There's coming a day, friend, and he knows it. And he can't stand this kind of stuff. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 3. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mockings, following after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire. If anyone ever asks you, how's it all going to end, look them in the face and say, it's going to burn. Are you sure? Yes. What's going to happen? Is the sun going to fall on the earth? I don't know. It's just going to all burn. <laughs> Man, some of us in this room, we go, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen there? It's black and white, friend. Bank on it. It's going to burn. Every tinker toy you got in your house is going to melt under fervent heat. But the present heavens, verse 7, by his word are being preserved, reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up since all these things are to be destroyed in this way what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat but according to his promise we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells Therefore, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. The message from the Brownsville Revival is so in the word, it's scary, friend. Every night that I preach in this place, people look at me like I'm from the moon. And they'll come up to me. And they'll say, I got a call the other day where a man, a major minister said, man, that message has got to be preached all over America. I'm going, what in that message has got to be preached? It's all through the word. It's called get sober, get right, get righteous, get holy, get ready for the coming of the Lord. What do you mean? What is everybody else preaching? Why is it such a surprise? The day of his coming, this has got four points. Maybe I'll make it through the message before he comes back. But maybe I won't. Jesus, this would be a good time to come back. A good time. You can come back right now and be okay by me. Well, won't you miss this world? Not a drop of it, friend. Not a blade of grass. Not a Coca-Cola. Not a hamburger. Nothing. I won't miss anything on the face of this globe. Nothing here matters to me. And if you're tied down to this globe, something's wrong with you. I just read the word from the Lord. We're a pilgrim people. He's looking for a pilgrim people. That means your stakes aren't down deep and you ain't got roots in this ground. You're always on the move, ready to go. You might have a house, you might have a car, you might have a family, but you're always ready. 
You don't live in fear. What if we get in a plane wreck? What if we get in a car wreck? What if this happens? What if this happens? You teach your kids. Ryan, Shelby, Kelsey, if we die, hallelujah, we're with the Lord. It's going to be wonderful. It can happen any day now. Oh. The day of his coming. Number one. Can anybody tell that this is in my spirit tonight? It's in my spirit, friend. I'm going to tell you, this is one of those messages. If I don't preach it, it'll become a series. Because it keeps... It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I thought this morning, I said, Jesus, I know you're speaking to me about preaching this tonight. And if you don't allow me to preach it tonight, it's going to be a two and three and four parter. And that doesn't work in revival. I love series, but you can't preach series in revival because every night the crowds change. And so you got to go through all point one, two, three, four, five every night. So, Lord, thank you for letting me preach this. It's a fire shut up in my bones, friend. Number one, the day of his coming is certain. Write it down. I'll give you the scriptures in just a minute. Whew. Let me just show you something. There's some people here that are going, this guy is on planet X somewhere out there. He's just... Let me tell you how, where you're at, Bubba. <laughs> this right here is the Birmingham News, okay? Secular newspaper. This ain't charisma. This ain't Christianity Today. This is a secular newspaper. This is a headline a couple months ago. It's entitled, this is a front page in color. God's last call. Could you imagine? Could you imagine waking up in the morning, listen to me at home. Could you imagine waking up in the morning in a drunken stupor? You got a hangover. You had 18,000 drinks the night before. Now you've made yourself a Bloody Mary. You're trying to come alive. And you get the newspaper, your dog brings it in. It's got slobber all over it. And you look on the front cover and it says, God's last call. And you look at it, I thought this was the Birmingham News. What is this? You know what it says in here, friend? 66% of Americans, that's from New York to California, from the upper peninsula of Maine down to the tip of the Keys. 66% of Americans believe Jesus Christ is coming back. 74% in the southern, southeastern United States, that's Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida. 74% are certain that Jesus Christ is coming back. So if you're in this place, you're going, that's a bunch of, you're in the minority. have you know these are intelligent people these pollsters take intelligent polls I know because I've been in contact I'm having them take a poll for us we're working on a book right now called you knew better and I'm hiring these people to do some polls for us they're quality people you know what they do they'll take polls they'll call rich people poor people middle class people they'll call everybody they get a cross section that's why it's plus or minus three percent or five percent it's an accurate poll what they're saying is the majority of North Americans Believe any day now, any time now, in the future, the skies will split open and the Son of God will be standing there calling His church home. Oh! But friend, this doesn't mean penalty to me. This is interesting because most of them aren't living for God. You know, if 75% believe that Jesus is coming back, then that means 75%, if those 75% of our nation were living for Jesus, living holy, this nation wouldn't have the problems we have. We wouldn't have the problems we have. There would be no poverty here, friend, because people would share. People would share. There would be no guns in our schools. Why? Because prayer would have never been taken out. There would be prayer meetings all the time. Shoo, help me, Jesus. I'm not going to chase that rabbit. 
You can count on it. You can put all your apples in this basket. You can invest the whole wad on this venture and you'll win. This is not a pick and choose and hope for the best situation. This is certain. As certain as the sun shines by day, this is certain. As certain as you can wake up in the morning and go out to Pensacola Beach and look out there and see water. This is certain. As certain I can take this handkerchief and drop it and it falls to the floor. That's called gravity. Everyone knew it would fall to the floor. I'm telling you, this is certain. Jesus Christ is coming back again. You can count on it. You can bank on it. I love the Word of God. And we over-preach it sometimes here if you can ever do that. But we just give too many scriptures sometimes and people get lost. But Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. Oh, friend, there's so many here. I love this. And I love the way it says it. Luke 21, 25, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth dismay among nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Hmm. That's interesting. I never even saw that. Perplexed, the roaring of the seas and the waves. You ever seen what's going out in California right now? Man, I was watching the broadcast the other day, friend. And I looked at there and these are waves going over the top of houses. It's going, dear God, man, what is going on? Well, it's just El Nino. It'll pass. Maybe, maybe El Nino will give way to Mother Earthquake. And you go, well, that was, that was just a big one. That'll pass too. Well, let's swallow it up, half your city. When are you going to wake up? It's in the Bible. Earthquakes in divers places. The Bible says in verse 27 of Luke 21, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. It is certain. And there are people, I can feel this, you're listening at home, you're listening by radio, you're listening here in this church, you're going, I don't believe that for a minute. Well, I can take you to people that don't believe we went to the moon. You're in their class. I know people that, uh, one, one man looked at me in the face, he said, you listen to me, Steve Hill, that was all Hollywood. And I said, what? I said, I watched it in 1969, wasn't it? I said, I saw him. One small step, one large step. I saw it with my own eyes. He said, that was all Hollywood. We've never gone to the moon. We ain't got that kind of technology. Dear God. Oh, you're in the same camp, friend. Jesus said, in my Father's house, John 14, 2 and 3, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. See, if you believe in Jesus, Jesus wasn't a liar. He wasn't a liar. It means everything he said was true. When he's saying he's coming back, friend, he's coming back. I had a girl slam a door on my face one time out in California. I was going door to door. And I knocked on the door and she opened it up and I could smell the incense and the pot burning in there. And we started talking about Jesus and religions. And she said, oh, I've been born again. You know, and off into this metaphysical stuff and junk. And I listened to her for a few minutes. I said, well, let me just ask you a question. Do you believe the Bible is God's word? She said, oh, yes. And I said, do you believe the Bible is an accurate, uh, accurate recording of history and also of the words of Jesus Christ? She said, oh, yes, it's accurate. And I said, then the words in red in your Bible are the words of Jesus. She said, oh, absolutely. And then I said, was Jesus a liar? And uh, she looked at me. She was shocked I would say that. And she said, absolutely not. And I said, well, Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And she had just told me how there's a lot of different ways to heaven. And she looked at me. She said, I got to go. And slammed the door in my face. 
Some of you are just like that. You call yourself a Christian, but you're saying right now, preacher, I got to go. I gotta, I'm telling you, friend, confront yourself right now. Take a look at this doctrine of the church, which is going to happen just as sure as you're sitting in this place. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will, not might, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he is coming. Is anybody listening? Yeah. I'm telling you tonight, it is certain. It is certain. I want to tell you something else. When it happens, this video will sell out at the local Christian bookstores. <laughs> you hear me? They'll flock. There'll be lines outside the bookstores and there'll be bricks being thrown through them. Hopefully the owners didn't show up. <laughs> and you know where people are going to go? They're going to go straight to the prophecy tables. Why? Is this it? Is this is what they talked about? What's going on? They'll find this tape right here called the day of his coming. And they'll hear the first point. It's certain. And you missed it, friend. You missed it. Number two, and I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this one, and there's so much material, just bear with me. There's been books printed on this, and you try to fit it into 30, 45 minutes, it's impossible. The day of his coming is close. These are all C words. Number one, the day of his coming is certain. The day of his coming is close. How close? Close. Real close. Really, really close. Soon. Whew. Most prophetic teachers are quick to point to several key events of this century, and I'm just going to touch on a few. And some of the things that are taking place in these present days, many of them will point Prophetical teachers will point to the rebirth of Israel back in 1948 because Jesus spoke. The disciples asked him, tell us, when will all these things be? And the word of God says, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus said, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Israel in prophecy is often referred to as a fig tree. And you'll find most prophet preachers, prophetical preachers, will turn to that and they'll say, listen, in 1948, the fig tree was born. Put out its branches. Jesus said, when you see that happen, his coming is near. I like that. I like what's happening in Israel right now. And I don't understand all the scriptures about Gog and Magog. And I love the prophets that come up and the prophecy teachers. And Mike is a great teacher and, and, and he's helped me on some of this. And I don't know if Gog is Russia or not. Maybe Gog is Russia. I've lived in Russia. I know that there's something behind there that no one's seen. Everybody thinks it's all gone away. No, friend, there's a rumbling in the mulberry bush. You think there's freedom in Russia? Go think again, friend. You got to live over there. We got some friends here that live over there, have a Bible school. Underneath the current of that society, there's a group of people, they want communism back and they're going to get it back at all costs. They love to fight. But there's other things, friend, that I look to. Probably the one thing that I look to and are more fascinated than any, that fascinates me more than anything else is what Daniel said in Daniel 12, 4. He said, as bad, as bad as for you, Daniel, this prophet received this from the Lord concerning these words, seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Would you stay with me just a minute? How many will stay with me? I want you to imagine in this place, you know Zippo about prophecy. Okay, no, nothing, okay? Just absolutely zero. That's good. That's fine. 
I want you to listen to me. The Bible talks about a day where you cannot buy or sell unless you have a mark. Okay? The Bible talks about that. Now, if you talked about this 200 years ago with John Wesley, they'd have turned their heads like this and say, oh, I just can't, you know. Maybe so, but I can't really fathom how that would work in our society. But nowadays, things are different. How many will stay with me just for a minute tonight? Some of you are going to hate me for this kind of stuff. I've had, I've had cashiers at restaurants, cashiers at Walmarts, places like that, tell me to shut up when I talk to them. I'll go through in there and, and she'll be waving my little groceries across a little star, you know. Did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. And I'll go like this, I'll go, did it. And I'll say, you know something, it won't, come, it won't be long where I won't have to use a credit card, won't have to use a check. The people will come in here, they'll have a little mark on their hand. They'll just wave it across. And then someone will say, well, what, what if their hand got chopped off? Well, it'll also be imprinted on their forehead, just in case. Did it. <laughs> Will you be able to see it? I don't know. I don't care. All I know is it's right here. Wake up, church. You talk about knowledge, and I'm going to give you some stats on knowledge, then we're going to move on where we're at in the world scene right now. This was given to me yesterday. This came, friend, from a law that they tried to pass in Congress just a short while ago, and I've got all this documented because of you unbelievers out there who we here you know I, I said something to a staff member the other day I said you know we are becoming so brilliant the only thing out there that I cannot understand that has not been done is um, pumping gas I said that is the most archaic thing in the world that we do you get out of your car you walk over to this robotish looking thing that doesn't do it's got arms and it won't do anything for you. It just stands there. You've got to do everything. You've got to put your card in there. Or you've got to go, dee, 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 whatever. You've got to pick up the lousy thing that somebody slobbered gas all over before you got there. Then you've got to tell you, you've got to stick it in your car, and you've got to stand there and pump it. That is so archaic, friend. That sounds like something during the Westerns in the society we live in. And I thought, well, I'm not going to believe any of this stuff until we've sol we solved this problem. This came across the internet today. <laughs> Robotic gas pumps. <laughs> They're in Sweden. Those of you from Sweden, you know what I'm talking about. They're working on the Volvos and the Mercedes Benz, but they're going to fine tune those things for every jalopy in America. And you're going to pull up to the gas pump and they'll have a couple lines where you pull up. This is easy. No problem. Just pull up to the lines. And there's going to be a sensor. There's going to be a sensor. And this, within 10 years, remember these words, within 10 years, you won't imagine pump gas. Pump gas. You won't touch that nozzle. Forget me, man. Forget you. You'll pull up. You'll drive down those little rows. You'll pull up to the gas pump. It'll read the sensor. You'll pull the, 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 the latch. It'll pop open. And automatically, the robotic arm will come in It'll touch the cap, it'll turn the cap, it'll fill the gas. It reads the sensor, never misses. They've already got the technology. It doesn't matter what kind of car you have. All you have to do is have that new sensor. And all these gas pumps, ladies, you'll never have to get out of the car in the cold. <laughs> but you got to have the mark to use it. No, just kidding. <laughs> I take back my clap. But this came in the mail. Somebody gave this to me yesterday. Stay with me just for a few minutes. This, this is for those of you that don't believe in any of this stuff, okay? This is all secular, okay? Take the Bible, close it, put it away if you want to. This is prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. This is called mandatory direct deposit. If you work for the government, back in 1995, they gave this to Congress, and Congress said, I like this idea. 
Now it's becoming law. This year, at the end of this year, it'll be absolutely mandatory. If you work for the government, if you're a veteran, if you receive Social Security, any type of benefits, forget a check. You'll never get another one after 1998. From now on, it's fully automated. You have an account. You have a number. That's all you are is a number. This is it right there. And there's a sign on the front of this, and it shows Einstein tapping on a blackboard, and it says, what you must do you talk control friend you don't have an option if you want your check from the government this is what it says right here every single person veterans benefits social security federal government and military pensions and salaries or any government payment you'll never see the money you better have a number this is scary because if they can pull this off, if they can pull this off, they can pull the next system off. And the next system is this. You work for the government, you're going to use your number everywhere you go. We've already got control of your account. We put the money in there. If you don't abide by what we're saying, see, we're trying to uncomplicate the system. You're going to use this number. You've got an automatic debit card now. But that's archaic too. Quit carrying around that little piece of plastic. Take a chip. Go up to the Coke machine and touch it with your hand and a Sprite will come out. Friend, we're not talking 10 years down the road. This is becoming law this year. Wake up. You talk about knowledge increasing. 75% of all the scientists who ever lived are alive right now. President Clinton in the State of the Union address just last week or a couple weeks ago says this, the entire store of human knowledge now doubles every five years. I want you to, that to sink in. That means every five years, today, this is 1998, by the year 2003, we will know twice as much as everything we know. Just take your encyclopedia set. Take the encyclopedia set. We will know twice as much in five years. Just a few hundred years ago, it took 500 years for that to roll over. Now, in five years, our knowledge doubles. This is just an example. In 1980, it took a scientist to identify a gene causing cystic fibrosis. It took them nine years. Now, they just discovered in nine days what causes Parkinson's disease. They say a child born in 1998 could easily live to the 22nd century. I'm telling you right now, if they, if they knew back in 1970 what they know now about heart disease, my father would be sitting in this revival with me tonight. But my father died of a heart attack in 1970. If he had died, if he had had that heart attack in 1985, he'd have never died. He'd be living today with the technology that they have. Is anybody listening? Let me just throw some of this out to you. Two years ago, a typical home computer could store 840 megabytes. Say that, 840 megabytes. Big deal, Steve. That's 840 million characters. Big deal, Steve. On its hard drive. That's a lot of megabytes. Say, that's a lot of megabytes. That's the most megabytes I've heard about tonight. But now, that was two years ago. That is archaic. See, just last week, we filled up a garbage can this high at our ministry offices full of, full of computer programs. And I stood there and watched them fill this trash can up with these computer programs. Computer programs that I paid money for. And I watched them. They're beautiful. <laughs> you know, they're colorful. The magazines and books and everything, you know, all the little discos. And, and here it goes. Fill up the whole huge trash can. And I turned to Doug. I said, Doug, can any of this stuff good? He goes, Steve, this is from the prehistoric age. Yeah. Doug, I bought it last year. Yeah. Last year I bought this stuff. No, friend. Nowadays, it used to be 840 megabytes. That means 840 million characters. Today, it's unheard of to have less than two 
gigabytes. That means two billion characters. Let me explain that to you. IBM recently put 11.6 gigabytes of information on one square inch of disk space. That is the same as putting an 18-story stack. 18 stories. Let's say that is high. Say that with me. That is high. 18-story stack of papers. 18 stories high. What IBM just did, put 18 stories of written paper matter on an area the size of your thumbnail. That's impossible. That's where we're at, friend. We're living in a new age. Stay with me. It's close. Jesus said, Ooh, boy. It's turning into a series. I can feel it. <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew 24, And Jesus answered and said to them, Seed it to you that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. I looked at this today, friend. Just bear with me for a few minutes because there's some folks in this place. Look what's going on. Time Magazine, America's fascination with Buddhism. Religion is on the rise. Buddha. Religion is on the rise all over America. Nostradamus. All over America. Hinduism. Shrines are filling up. Islam. Confucius. Eastern religions. Growing in leaps and bounds, friend. I've got a book right here with all the cults. Index of all the cults and religions. It'll blow your mind, the people that are operating all over America, friend. Thousands and thousands of sects and cults are operating in this nation, sucking our kids out of our schools. Do you know in most of our schools in this nation, they have a free day for religion? You can go down to the campus, the Union campus, and everybody's preaching their doctrines. You can go get involved in witchcraft. It can be a Satanist. You can go across and talk to a Krishna. You can walk over here and talk to a Buddhist. You can walk over here. It's a free day. Anything goes. Friend, I want to tell you, 40, 50 years ago, they'd have been locked up. They'd have been locked up. You don't believe me? You need to read the history of America. You need to read what kind of prayers our forefathers prayed just 50 years ago. In America 50 years ago, when you stood up in Congress, this is how you prayed. Father, in heaven, we plead with you today for our nation. We pray that you'd give us wisdom in this congressional meeting today. We pray that you would give us heavenly wisdom. And we thank you, Father, for watching over our nation. And we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you'd hear a rumble across Congress. Amen. You didn't have anybody standing up going, wait just a minute. I'm a Buddhist. Wait just a minute. I'm this. I'm that. Sit down. In God we trust. There's one God over this nation. We've changed, friends. Something's gone wrong somewhere. I'm just going to make a mess up here. I don't care. <laughs> nations will rise against nations and kingdom against kingdoms. And in various places, there will be famines. Friend, if you think famines are going away, get yourself. Those of you in the ministry teams, God bless you. I love you for going off to these foreign countries. But Mike, I pray that they'd visit some countries where kids are just screaming at them, got flies all over their faces, and these kids would understand that we're living in a world right now that's at the edge of his coming. Every time a famine breaks out in some area of the world, right now in North Korea, people are living on like 10 spoonfuls of day. They're dying in North Korea. We don't even think about it. I pray that our youth, our ministry teams would go to some of these countries and I pray that you'd go there and you'd catch some sicknesses. Get close to some of these kids and hug them. Pick the flies off of them. Pick the leeches off of their bodies. Take, open up their mouth and brush their teeth. Get the grunge and the grime off of them. Put them on the hospital bed and help the nurses drain them of all the worms that are inside them. 
So you better understand the words of Jesus. Famines. Look for them. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Say, Jesus, if you're coming back, I want as many of these people to be saved as possibly can. Use me, Jesus, in the redemption of these souls right now, Lord. I don't want anyone to miss. You're coming. Many false prophets will arise. Many will fall away. Shoo we. For men, 2 Timothy 3. Stay with me just a couple more minutes. How many will? Charlie, why don't you clean this up for me, buddy? I've got so much here. For those of you that don't understand what's going on with knowledge in this nation, you need to get some of these magazines. This is the power of invention. This is Newsweek magazine, and it shows this century. Did you know we came, we went from the, we went, friend, in one century from the invention of the paper clip. Is anybody listening? The paper clip and the straw and the paper cup. These were big items in the 1900s. Now, we're cloning animals. Now, with I believe it's nanosurgery, they're making robots so small, they're going to be able to go into your human body. Think about this. Those of you with internal injuries, you're in a car accident, they will send a little bitty robot to go inside of you and sew up your problems. The technology's already here. It's spooky. Quit living with your head in the sand. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revelers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. I've never preached like this, friend, on this subject. Bear with me. Here's one of the problems in America right now, and those of you from other nations, I want you to listen up. See, we're dealing with a nation that's being confronted about their belief system. If you call yourself a Christian, when people say, I can't come to revival, why? I can't, go, I can't do that. I can't come to prayer meeting, why? You know what 99% of the time the problem is? A ball game. It's football night. That's the problem. Pastor, not Monday night. That's when I bowl. I bowl with the gang on Monday night. I got, I got a team. I can't pray on Monday night. I can't. I can't come to revival night after night. Dear God, I'll miss the Tonight Show. If Jay Leno doesn't speak into my life, I'm undone. We laugh, friend, but I'm going to tell you there's people that live by these rules. They haven't had a decent day unless they sit in front of that iron, that box that's, that's beaming at them and zombieizing them, if that's a word. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I got to go fishing. I got to go hunting. I got to do this. I got to do that. I want to tell you something, friend. Get in your closet. Tell God that. Get in your closet. And a matter of fact, say it like this. God, I just want to be straight with you. I am not going to revival because I want to get up early in the morning and go hunting. Okay? And let me tell you something else. I will not go to Monday night prayer meetings or Tuesday night prayer meetings because I want to stay home and watch television. Quit giving me some religious crazy answer like you're too busy. Why don't you fall into the prophecy? Put yourself right there in black and white. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God.
And when people say to me, well, I go to church. Whoa, impress me. Man, God stands at attention when you walk through the doors. I don't think so, friend. So you give a tithe of your time, a tithe of a day maybe. You've got an hour and a half holding to a form of godliness but denying its power. Paul said to Timothy, avoid people like this. Young people in this room, I want to tell you something, and you can go ahead and hate me for it. And parents, you can hate me for saying it to the kids. Either get in or get out. Get in or get out. It is sheer hypocrisy to sit in that service day after day after day and bust in hell wide open the rest of your life. Make up your mind. Who are you going to serve? Because we're dealing with a nation right now. This Sunday, churches are going to be full of people going to hell. And I want to tell you where I got that from. I got it from pastors. I've traveled all over this nation. And I used to do seminars in Catholic churches, Lutheran churches, Baptist churches. I've spoken all over because of my drug background. I've spoken all over. And I've had Baptist pastors say to me, if Jesus Christ came back, I don't think half my people would make it. Because they know their people, pastor. They know the people. They know Joe that's sitting on the bench, that old grouch. Somebody sits in his seat. He's on. <laughs> he ain't going to sing the songs and he sure ain't going to give because somebody's sitting in his seat. We had a lady. Poof. Every time the pastor got up to preach, she'd get up and she'd sit in the front row and she'd wait for him to open up the word. He'd say, I want to open up the word today to Matthew chapter 6. She'd get up and she'd go. All the way out the back of the church. Just, we called her Sister Trot. Just, <laughs> you got them like that in your church too. I know you do, friend. <laughs> Drive you up the wall. I'm going, what is going on here? Go, go trot out there with the horses or something. Sit down and listen to the word of God. Get fed. Go after God. Worship him. Praise him. Get on your knees and go after Jesus. Quit holding to a form of godliness. Go after God. Quit playing games. I preached last night. Gambling with grace. Quit gambling with grace. The Bible says in James 5, 8, you too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Oh, here's another magazine. I love this one. The death of privacy. You know what that is? Let me share something with you, friend. You might as well get ready. They're already putting chips in your animals. All right? That's not future technology. You can go get a chip now for your animal to where your animal will never get lost again. It's hooked to a satellite to a navigational system and to your computer. You can click your neighborhood and there's Fido. <laughs> if they can do it for Fido, they can do it with your automobile, they can do it on your body. No problem, friend. Your privacy's over. Somebody's watching you. I don't believe all that stuff. Wake up. Wake up. Our president will tell you somebody's watching. <laughs> he, he will. He'll say, you know, you got a point, Steve. <laughs> somebody's, somebody's always watching. There's always a birdie out there, friend. There's always three witnesses, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You never got away with nothing. I'm going to close in just a minute. This is from Chip Woolwine, a man that's under persecution in Niceville, Florida. I don't know if you're here tonight, Chip, but this is in the newspaper just a couple days ago. What's today? 11th? Yesterday. This is a newspaper yesterday. He talked about right here. It's called accepting Jesus as he is. I'm talking about mockers in these last days. Those of you that call yourselves Christians, you go after God, but you get around a fanatic and it bothers you. 
It bothers you. Here's Chip Woolwine. He's kicked off his position in school. You want to know why? Niceville, I want you to listen to this. This is crazy. You've got kids that are suicidal in that school. You've got your kids in that school that are drug addicts. They're alcoholics. They'll probably, some of those kids will end up killing one another down the road. But you can go in the library and open up a satanic Bible or go in the library and open up a witchcraft manual and talk to them all day long about that stuff. But don't open the Word of God to them. Don't dare pray with them. Don't dare do that because you're violating all these rights. And that's what happened with Chip. He just leads these kids to Jesus. They start getting saved. They come to the Brownsville Revival. They still come. You'll see them this weekend. They come by the scores to this revival. It's phenomenal. They haven't been hindered by this at all, but they kick him off. He's a vice principal, wasn't he, of the school. Loved by all the students. And they're printing this. This is in their paper. This is lovely that they're still printing this kind of stuff. And he tells a story about the days when Jesus cured a man. He said, pick up your mat and walk. And the man got up and walked. He was a cripple. And you would think that the people would go, whoa, ho, oh, God's in the house, change the agenda. But no, you know what they said? They said, wait a minute, you can't do that on Sunday. You can't do that. Think about it, friend. Miracles. And here this man is leading people to Jesus which 50 years ago was fine. Less than 50 years ago in our nation, you could pray in school. A good friend of mine, a, a, a great reporter in this nation, for the, one of the top newspapers in this nation, told me, he said, he remembers when he was growing up in school, they'd open up every day in prayer. Every day in prayer, it was just common to pray. Now, all these people, in 1998, teenagers are being saved and healed by Jesus. Jesus is delivering them from depression and thoughts of suicide. Jesus is breaking their chains of bondage to drugs, alcohol, and the terrifying memories of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. And he says, are our leaders excited about the healings? Do they want to find out more about Jesus, a miracle worker, Jesus, a savior, Jesus, a healer? No, once again, they miss it. I guarantee you we're dealing with the mockers and the scoffers in these last days. The religious world is rising up and going, bah, humbug with Brownsville. Who cares if all those people are coming through there and getting right with God and alcoholics are being saved and delivered. I was watching tonight some of you folks that were into alcoholism and drugs just going bananas jumping around this place. And someone else will come. You've been delivered from alcoholism. You are, you, are, you are a menace on the highway driving down the road, stoned out of your mind on alcohol. Now you're clean, full of the Holy Ghost. And they look at you and they go, oh, I can't stand all that emotionalism. It's like they're saying, oh, you are better off drunk. Get a life, leaders. Wake up. It's all prophecy being fulfilled. Well... I knew this would happen. Shh, man. Just skip four pages. My third point, and then I've got one point after that, and that's the last point. You get the point? <laughs> I knew this would happen. The day of his coming will be chaotic. The day of his coming will be chaotic. as it was in the days of Noah. Just write the scripture down, Matthew 24. I preached a message entitled, The Sermon from the Last Summit one day in this place, what it was like in the days of Noah. And the sermon from the last summit was a man who shimmied up the last tree on the last hill that was not covered by water. He was at the very top of the last branch, holding on for dear life. His wife was holding on to him. He had a, one of his kids around his arms, what kind of message that man from the sermon at the top of the tree of the last summit would preach at Brownsville? What do you think he would say? 
One of the things he would say is things are not as they seem. They were eating, drinking, and giving in marriage. But then it began to rain. He would tell everybody this. When everybody says peace and safety, beware. I'm here to testify to you. My whole family has perished. My grandfather, my grandmother, my brothers, my sisters, only me and my wife were the last people on earth. And in a few minutes, we're going to die. And he, as he watches the ark bobbing in the water, the ark has claw marks all over the sides of it. Fingernails have been pressed into it and ripped off. People trying to get in that boat. And they all perish. Carcasses floating all around this man as he's holding on for dear life. What a message he would preach. It's going to be wicked on that last day, friend. It's going to be chaotic. Jesus said in Luke 17, I tell you on that night there will be two men in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. There's coming a day, friend, and it could happen tomorrow morning. It could happen at 1.35 tonight. Airplanes will fall from the sky as pilots disappear from the cockpits. Air traffic controllers will no longer be at their post. They will be causing innumerable collisions and crashes from misjudging landings. Motors around the world will vanish from behind the wheels causing massive pileups on freeways and city streets. Police and firefighters will have vanished causing the accidents to be even more uncontrollable. Doctors, nurses, and medical specialists will be frantic trying to care for twice as many people with up to half the staff. Parents will be stricken as they discover their young children have disappeared. Could you imagine what it's going to be like on that day? Parents, how much do you love your kids? How many times has, Daddy, has, has Johnny come home singing, Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And you say, Martha, isn't it good that the church comes to pick up our kids on Sunday morning? They're getting such a good religious training. One day, friend, you're going to wake up and you're going to search frantically for those kids. And you say, Martha, 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 they just ran away. They're just playing a little game right now. The game's going to go on, friend. 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. You're going to still be looking for your kids. But you said, it's going to be a citywide manhunt, and it's not going to be just your kids. Thousands are missing from all over the city. And there's going to be parents groping in darkness with flashlights trying to find them. And you're going to hear one word on the lips around this nation. It'll be headlines in every major secular paper. And the word will be rapture. 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 Remember, most Americans believe in the rapture. Nations will suspect other nations. War will engage. Nuclear armaments will increase the destruction because panic is sweeping through these countries and it will cause the nations to go into a tailspin of chaos and anarchy. Million dollar corporations will come crashing into bankruptcy as CEOs and managers on all levels leave businesses without leaders. Thousands will lose their jobs and financial security despondency will spread. Mass suicides will occur as backslidden husbands discover that their families are gone. Looting and destruction will sweep the nations. Hysteria will rule in city streets. Horror will grip hearts. There'll be other signs in the sky. The moon turned blood red. The sun darkens. Meteorites fall from the sky. Smoke rises towards heaven. Earthquakes, famines, confusion. Everywhere. Everybody stand. The day of his coming. It's certain. It's close. It's going to be chaotic. And I tried to simplify it, friend, tonight. I really have. I've tried to simplify it. My brother and I are working right now. I'm writing a book called You Knew Better. It's for a secular company. One of the top publishers in the nation. And I'm working on it as quickly as I can, but I'm tired. It's called You Knew Better. 
My brother who worked for the Grateful Dead is working on some of the research for me. Doug, also who works with me, is doing some of the research. But my brother who's out in California, we're hooked up with the computers and we got him going back and forth, cannot stay up with the technology. He's pulling his hair out. And I said, George, we've got to stop and print the book. We've got to stop and print it. We've got to stop somewhere. And all he's doing is giving these, he's, I'm telling him what to pull up. I'm saying, George, stay on top of the chip. Stay on top of the chip. Stay on top, George, of the mark of the beast. And he can't stay on top of it. Every time we get somewhere, they move forward light years. And I want the book to be as current as possible. And we're pulling our hair out trying to do that. The meat of the book is already there. What I want to print is there. We're adding all these, these inserts and these references because it's a secular book. It's not for the Christian world. Twenty years ago, you'd have never had this kind of problem. But right now, it's just in your face. Everything is pointing towards the second coming. Everything is pointing towards a second coming. It could happen any time. Well, Jesus has got to be preached around the world first. Friend, that could have happened 16 seconds ago. That could have been fulfilled three and a half minutes ago. Right now, the Father could be in heaven and he could have stood up as I'm speaking. He could be turning towards Jesus and saying, Jesus, Go get your pride. Go get your pride. Gabriel, sound the trumpet. It's over. My last point tonight was the day of the Lord is going to be comforting. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, comfort one another with these words. And I shared that for the last, friend, for this very reason. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This was to the church of Thessalonica. Gone through some hard times. Looking forward to the coming of the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. When someone talks to me, when Pastor or Mike or anybody talks to me about Jesus coming, I relax. I go, whoa, say that again. When my brother George says, Steve... Do you realize how close the mark is? That there's already humans with the mark. There's already people that have chips. They already have the chips. You know? And I think about these scriptures, I go, oh, George, say that again. Say that, say that we're right at no, when, no man will buy or sell unless he has the mark. Tell me again, George, that there's coming a time real soon where dollar bills and checks and credit cards will be extinct. They'll be just plastic and paper. You'll find them in the city dumps. Paper, the paper, just paper, the paper money. Kids will use it. They'll use that in Monopoly games. It'll mean nothing. It's worthless. Tell me that again, George. Now think of these scriptures. If Mike comes to me and says, Steve, do you know what's happening in Israel right now? This is being fulfilled. That is being fulfilled. I go, Mike, say that again, man. Are you telling me that any minute, he's going, yeah, any minute, Steve. Any second now, Jesus could come back. Any second now. You know what that is to me? That's comforting, friend. I go, dear God, Maranatha, come quickly. Come on, Jesus. You know, we're doing the best we can at the Brownsville Revival, but every time we lead people to Jesus, more get born. You know? And so it's just one of them things. You know what I'm talking about, Lord. You're watching it go on. And I want to see everybody say, but God, if you'd like to wind it all up, I'm fine. I'm fine. One of the reasons I'm fine is because my whole family's been saved. And I know many of you, your family has not been saved, but my family has gotten right at this revival. My whole family. My extended family is getting right right now. And so I'm saying, Jesus, this is just a personal thing. You can argue with God if you want to. You can, I'll say, Jesus, come back. And you say, hold it. Come back. Hold it. Come back. Hold it. 
God will make up his mind. He'll do what he wants to do. <laughs> but I'm saying, Jesus, I'm ready for you to come back. Those of you, the chairs, move them to the left and the right. Everyone else standing to your feet. I read to you, as they're moving those chairs, I read to you. Charity, come join me, sis. I read to you a minute ago, everyone looked this way except those of you moving the chairs. That little article from Chip Woolwine, I try to use the most recent information, friend, and that's yesterday's stuff, okay? Look this way, don't be distracted. Do you know the people that are persecuting Chip Woolwine the most? You'll find them in churches on Sunday morning. It's not the heathen, it's the Christians. And I use that term very carefully. I use it with quotation marks. The people that call themselves Christians. They're the ones that are saying, stop that man from praying with kids. Oh, by the way, you can give them condoms. Let them have an abortion. Take them down to the abortion clinic. She can have an abortion. But don't warn her before she ever gets pregnant and pray with her to keep her, keep her virginity. Don't do that, Chip Woolwine. But we'll help abort the baby. Something's wrong. And these are Christians. These are the religious people in this nation, friend. Something's gone wrong. Mockers and scoffers. I'm telling you tonight, friend, I will stand and take the heat. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference to me today what the secular press says. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. I've had it said about me all over the nation. I don't care anymore. It just doesn't matter. I want to stand for righteousness. I'm going to stand for holiness. I'm going to stand for right living. I'm going to stand for godliness. And if people don't like it, they don't like it. They can blast you. They can nail you to the wall. They can say anything they want to. One of the top comedians in the nation on a program called Politically Incorrect was talking about the Brownsville Revival and was talking about these bunch of people down here and he was talking about, well, some wind blew through there and, you know, that's what happened, man. The power of God came down in this place on Father's Day. And he said, man, alive. And he said, they're a bunch of idiots. I hear that and I go, whoa. Yes. Yes. They called Jesus demon-possessed. They said he was full of the devil. So it doesn't matter. My sister called me and she said, Steve, do you have any idea what the guy just said about you guys? I said, what did he say? Na -na 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 I said, well, Susie, that figures. The guy is as unborn again as an unborn again person can be. He's living in darkness. But it's the Christians out there, the religious people, and some of you are in this room that just get me, man. You get me. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. At the beginning of the service, I said this statement. I said there's some people here that are reserving something, you're holding back something from God. I want everyone to look this way. Everyone lying in around the church, I want you to look this way. I know you may have heard this before, but if the Lord should come back tonight, are you certain he would come back to get you? Or would there be something that you had to take care of? I preached three weeks ago a message entitled, No Time to Wash Up. There's going to be no time to clean your wedding garments. Let me ask you this. If we were all on an airplane, all on a jumbo jetliner, and the technology, the way it's going, there's coming a day where they'll fit a couple thousand people on one airplane. And we're all on our way to L.A., everyone in this room, everyone within the sound of my voice. And we're flying over Albuquerque, New Mexico, and about 25 miles east of Albuquerque, heading west. There's an explosion. And we look out the window of the craft and we see one of the jet engines is on fire. Panic fills the plane. Some of you just scream bloody murder. Others are just quietly panicking. 
And then a sound comes over the intercom, a, a healthy, encouraging word from the pilot. And he said, this is Captain Smith, and we're having major malfunction of our right jet engine, but this plane has been, has been built to fly with a full load on one engine. I have radioed ahead. They're waiting us for us in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We can come in with the left engine. So people breathe a sigh of relief. And the pilot says this. The flight attendant will now have everyone, will instruct everyone in how to get into the crash position. Should we have any type of difficulties in landing? And so she explains or he explains how you bend over and you put your head between your knees and you get in that crash position. At the time everyone's in the crash position, another explosion occurs, this time off the left side of the aircraft. Everyone looks over, the left engine is on fire. No more announcements. The plane begins to rock. Then it begins to nosedive. And everybody knows everybody is going to die. We're at 30,000 feet. It's a jumbo jetliner, and it's racing towards judgment. Everybody knows. There's no more announcements. The flight attendants are screaming. Everyone's going to die. The centrifugal force has thrown passengers out of their seats back to the tail of the plane, just through the air. People are already dying. In a situation like that, if you are strapped in your seat, knowing you are going to die, would you Repent, or would you worship? Would you say, Jesus, this stuff in my heart, you know, this stuff, this lust that I just had for that person in this plane, anything, Jesus, that's between me and you, Lord, forgive me. Or would you go, Jesus, into your hand, I commit my spirit. Think about it, friend. Would you repent? Or would you worship? If the answer is you'd have to get something out of your life, then right here at this altar is where you're going to do it. You're going to do it right now, friend. Whatever it might be, don't let anything, friend, stop you from going up when that trumpet sounds. If you're backslidden in this place and there's something there that's keeping you from God, you may think it's small, friend, but there's nothing small in God's eyes. A little pornography problem, a little lust problem, a little this, a little that. You're going to come down to these altars. You're going to get right with God. If you're in this place and you're a chronic liar, you just lie when the truth fits better. You need to repent. The Bible says, Revelation 21, 8, some liars will be found in the lake of fire. No, I wish for your sake it said that, friend, but it says all liars will be found in the lake of fire. Will be cast into the lake of fire. See, that book's serious. I don't know if you are, but that book is serious. So if you've got a problem, if you're a thief, you're going to hit these altars. An adulterer, you're going to hit these altars. A fornicator, you're going to hit these altars. A homosexual, you're going to hit these altars. If you're in this place and you have eyes for another woman or another man and you're married, you're going to hit this altar. Tell you what, there's some folks in this place, you've committed, it's called the spirit of murder. You've looked at another woman, you've looked at another man. You've fallen in love with them. You've never said anything, never held her hand, never kissed her, never would dare say a thing to her. But what you've done is when you look at him, or look at her, you think, I wonder what it would be like to be married to him. The fantasy begins to develop. What would it be like to go to Disney World with him and go on vacation, go on a cruise with him? What would it be like waking up Christmas morning with him or her instead of the husband I'm with? You know what that is, friend? That's the spirit of murder. That's how murders are committed. Oh, you're not going to kill your wife or your husband. But that spirit is there. You're thinking, you're looking at life as if they were dead. You know when you should have cut that? At the very beginning of the thought. As soon as that thought came across your mind, you should have said, I wash that in the blood. Get behind me, devil, you lying thief. You came to steal, kill, and destroy my marriage. But no, some of you in this room have entertained it. And I want to tell you, it's repenting time. You've already given the devil so much leeway. 
and you need to pull back that rope, pull it all the way back in. Tonight, get down at these altars. Get right with God. Those of you that are backslidden, you're doing things that Jesus would never do. That's what sin is. Those of you that have never known the Lord, I'm warning you, Jesus is coming back. I don't believe you, Steve. He's still coming back. Whether you believe me or not. The Bible says it and that settles it, whether you believe it or not. He's coming back. Those of you in this room that are religious, stay with me, friend. If there's ever a scripture tonight for religion, it's these scriptures that I've read. Form of godliness. It makes no difference to God how many stained glass windows you have ornating your church. It makes no difference to God if you have a, cruci a crucifix hanging on every door. It makes no difference to God, friend, if Sunday morning, this Sunday morning, just like here at Brownsville, you have communion. I'm telling you, you can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand. You can go to hell with baptismal waters all over your face. You can go to hell with a christening certificate hanging behind your, your desk at home. You can go to hell with a certificate from the assemblies of God saying you're ordained in good standing with the assemblies of God. You can be in good standing with the assemblies and in bad standing with God. Because the assemblies doesn't know about the secret sins that may be going on. So friend, how about it? Where are you at with Jesus? Religious person, do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Are you consumed with him? Are you consumed with him? If not, I question your salvation. And if you, if you don't like these kind of preaching, then what you need to do, you need to take what I've said tonight, go in a closet and argue with God. Tell God that Steve said, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be in love with you, Father, Steve said. Steve said, I'm supposed to be in love with your son, Father. Steve said, I'm supposed to wake up in the morning with Jesus on my heart and go to sleep at night with Jesus on my heart. Steve said, I'm supposed to be white hot for Jesus. Talk to God about it. You'll hear words like this. If you're ashamed of him, he's ashamed of you. If you're lukewarm, he'll spew you out of his mouth. It's a word, friend. So Charity's going to sing Mercy Seat, and you're going to come forward. I know I've been long tonight, friend, but this is one of the... If you knew how many pages I skipped. But here's what we're going to do. Everyone in this room that has sin in their life, you know there's something between you and God. There's already folks ready to come forward. You know there's something between you and God. If there's ever a night not to hesitate, this is it. Don't hesitate. As soon as charity begins to sing, you come in the balcony. You come down here. If there's anything between you and the Lord, you come quickly and get on your face before God and get it right. And don't let pride hold you back. Pride will say, I don't need to go down there. That's from the hell itself, friend. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Mike's preaching tomorrow on humility. You want to, you friend, humility, when you humble yourself, God kisses you. Humble yourself tonight. Break away from the devil's shackles. Break away from those chains. Get away from your pew. Come down from the balcony. Get down here and get right with God. Everyone who's away from God. Everyone who needs forgiveness. Everyone who has sin in their life. I want you to come quickly right now. Hurry right now. Hurry right now. Hurry. Hurry. Hurry in the balcony. Let's go. Hurry. 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 Come on. Close. 
It's certain. It's going to be chaotic. And if you are a Christian, you would be comforted by this message. Right now, ask the Lord to wash you. Ask the Lord to cleanse you. Ask the Lord to make you new. Right now, He'll come into your life. He'll cleanse you, man. He'll make you brand new. Come on. Come on. Hurry. 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 We're not playing games tonight, friend. I'm tired. The Spirit of God's in this place. He's wooing you. He's calling you. He's wooing you. He's calling you. He's wooing you and he's calling you. If you're coming, come right now. Matter of fact, I want everyone to turn to the person next to them and I want you to ask them this question. Do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? And when you ask them that question and somebody says that to you, don't you lie to them. If you need forgiveness, you tell them the truth and then both of you come down together. Everyone do it right now. Turn to the person next to you. Ask them if they need forgiveness and bring them down right now. Hurry, 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 come on. Hurry, come on, come on. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. Hurry, God bless you. God bless you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For we have graced all bow your heads we're gonna close everyone at the altar bow your heads close your eyes Jesus Christ is in this place to forgive to wash to make brand new he's in this place to forgive to wash to make brand new he'll do that everyone at this altar bow your heads those of you at home bow your heads bow your heads right now we're gonna pray this prayer and if you're serious Jesus will forgive you he'll wash you right now pray this prayer with me dear Jesus Friend, don't mumble this prayer. This is a serious night. This could be the last night of revival. This could be it for you. This could be it for all of us. I want you to pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me. Jesus, I know you're coming. And I'm going to be ready. And tonight, Jesus, I pray that you would wash me. This sin in my life. Cleanse me. Make me new. Wash me clean. I ask you tonight to forgive everything I've done. Everything I've done wrong. I repent. I ask you, Jesus, to be my Savior. Be my Lord and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours and you are mine. Come live your life through me. And Jesus, I'm going to anticipate your coming. I know it's soon. I know it's at the door. I will not be taken by surprise. Thank you, Lord, for touching me tonight, washing me in your precious name. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
I want, you to, I want you to understand something. Everyone at this altar, look this way. 300,000 people, over 300,000 have come to these altars from all walks of life. Every religious background known to man. The other day, a host of Marines marched down here. Marines gave their lives to Jesus. I've had senators, we've seen congressmen, a federal judge came running over here. We've seen political leaders come and get right with God. We've seen millionaires, billionaires come to this place and God speak to their lives, change their lives. We've also seen dirt poor people, every kind of person in the world, housewives, teachers, everybody's the same, friend. I want to encourage you to do this. Look this way, everybody. I want to encourage you to get all the sin out of your life, whatever it might be. You hear me? Whatever it might be. You're going to see something. If you'll do this, if you'll get the sin out, God will kiss your soul. I'm talking about the videos. I'm talking about junk, pot, alcohol, anything that's out there. Get rid of it. I got a letter today from a girl. If you were here three weeks ago, there was a girl standing right over here that was demon-possessed. She started screaming out in the service. And, and as I was, we were praying together, her eyes were rolling back up in her head. She was into Satanism for years. Wild as can be. And people were freaking out being around her because they thought the demons would jump on them. It was one of those wild nights right here. I got a letter from her today. Eight pages. Halfway through the, matter of fact, three times through the letter she was testing me. And she, she, she would write, I can't believe you've read this far. And I read through that letter. And she said, when I got back to Indianapolis, she's in a program called Teen Challenge. She said, I went straight to an area in my room where I had stuff hidden. And she had brought into that program, which is a Christian program, she had brought cigarettes, she had brought 10 CDs of satanic music. I mean, she had, she had a list of things that she had to get. And the other girls in the program did the same thing. Those are things that they got into the program. What on earth did they leave at home? And she said, as soon as we got rid of all that stuff, we could sense the Spirit of God come all over us, the favor of God. As a matter of fact, shh, she said, she said, as soon as we got rid of those things, she said, while they, while they were all there, we could feel demons in the room. But when we got rid of all those things, there's peace. I'm telling you, friend, get rid of the junk, anything that's not pleasing to God. Who's coming tonight? Mike Brown, we got to do it quickly, brother. I went too long. Mike's going to share a couple things with you tonight. And then we're going to pray together. Please listen to these three points. And then we're going to pray together. God bless you. God bless you. And friend, listen to me. If you're here tonight and you think that you've come into a strange place, I want you to understand every denomination of the sun comes to this revival. Baptist, some of the, I've had, if, if you knew some of the people I know that have come here and they told me to keep it a secret. But they've come here. Why? Because they know it's God. They know God's moving. Just remember, what you have come and received tonight and what you're going to receive tonight when we pray for you is the foundation of the United States of America. The preaching that you just heard was par for the course in this nation. This is what you would hear from Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield. You could hear this from preacher's lips when this nation was founded. But we've gone wrong, friends. Something's happened over the years. We've watered down the gospel but that's turning. Mike's gonna share a few things with you. I'm gonna to speak to you very quickly. Everybody just stay right where you are. First, we just wanna call up any kids that came up, if you're 10 years old or younger, any children that responded to this call, we wanna give you a special book and talk to you. Okay, mom and dad can go with them, but if you're 10 or younger, just come right through the middle here, and Pastor Van, our children's pastor, is gonna take you and uh, give you a book and talk to you. So any kids that came up, Sometimes the kids go across the street on Thursdays, but if there are any kids, just make your way up. And one other thing before I speak to you, if we could have the help of as many uh, pastors and spouses of pastors, leaders that are here, if you're wearing a yellow tag and you did not need to respond to this altar call tonight, we would appreciate your help in speaking to those that came forward. What we'd ask you to do is go to either exit door, okay? Just go through the crowd of people and go to either exit door. If you could do that now, that would be great. As many of you as possible, all right? We know you're here to receive. We'll be praying for you in a little while, but if you could help us, that would be great. 
Get to either exit door. A worker will tell you how you can help. We appreciate it. Everybody just look this way. You're up here because you're serious. But the biggest thing is, as long as you have on this earth one day or 50 years, you want to be living for God from here on in. You don't want to be up and down and up and down and in and out. What I want to tell you is God's grace, God's help for you is sufficient so that you can live for him the rest of the days of your life. That messing up all the time is not the pattern of your life. That the rule is that you're walking with God and you're serious with God. Some of you are brand new. This is the first time you've ever responded to a call to give your lives to God. And some of you have been around for a long time and it's time to get serious. I want to say the same things to each of you. Just a few things. Make these foundations in your life. Number one, make sure every day it's your priority to spend time with God. Talk to Him through the day. Start your day talking to Him in prayer. You don't have to learn religious prayers. Just share your heart with Him. Talk to Him. During the day, you got problems, questions, needs. Talk to Him. Thank Him for things. At the end of the day, spend time with Him. Make it your priority. If you want to build a relationship with Him, you got to get to know Him. you got to share your heart with Him and read His Word every single day. If you'll put down the newspaper and shut off the TV and get off the computer, you'd be amazed how much extra time you have. Make it a habit. Read the Scriptures. Read the Bible through. You'll get a little book if you don't know how to get oriented with it and give you some guidelines. You'll get nourished. You'll get strong. You'll get clarity. Okay? It's a foundation. Prayer and the reading of Scripture. Get it into your system, number one. Number two, get planted in a healthy church or healthy congregation in your hometown. You can't make it on your own. You need to be part of a family and part of a team. The guy on television may bless you, but he's not going to come to you and pray for you when you're in the hospital, and he's not going to get in your face when you're making a stupid choice for the relationship, and he's not going to put you to work. You need a home base with other believers, other people who love Jesus, who preach the Bible as God's word and don't compromise. Get yourself plugged in and put roots down. You say, yeah, but I don't like people that get to know me. That's what you need. Let them get to know you warts and all. They got warts too. It could be that the guy who greets you at the door has bad breath. Get over it. All right? Better to be with Christians with bad breath than to go to hell with people with good breath. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, so listen. Get planted. If somebody brought you, say, well, where do you go? Let's, let's go there together. If you're from the area, there are plenty of good places we can refer you to. And if you have no idea where you're going, what to do, tell the worker, and we'll help give you some direction. Number three, get out to these meetings as often as you can. You see God's moving. There's rain coming down from heaven. It'll soak you. It'll saturate you. After just being with us for a few days, your vision will be clearer. Your resolve will be stronger. The joy will be there. Since God's doing this, take advantage of it. Okay, get out as often as you can. We say it for your sake, not for ours, because we're overwhelmed with people. And if it's impossible to get back here, find out if maybe in your home city somewhere or 100 miles away, God's moving in revival and get out there. If he's gracious enough to do it, take advantage of it, okay? And then last thing, if you have not been baptized as a believer, immersed in water publicly as a believer, you need to do it. It's a command. It's not an option. It's not, well, I don't feel it. Jesus said that we must believe and be baptized. We must turn from sin and be baptized. You may have had it done to you when you were a little baby, but that had no meaning or relevance in your life. You say, well, why do we have to go under the water? It's simple. We hold you under the water until you are dead. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, what did I get into? Listen, it's symbolic, okay? It, it doesn't, we don't really keep you down that long. You go down and you come up, and it means the old life die. Whether it's the drugs or the alcohol or the religious pride or just living for this world, that died, and now I'm living a brand new life, and I'm telling the world I'm a follower of Jesus, and I'm not ashamed. <laughs> If you haven't been immersed, baptized, since you have given your life to Jesus, you need to do it. And if you just come to the Lord tonight and you're serious about following him, tell the worker, you need to be baptized. Right now, somebody's going to come with a purple badge or a yellow leader's tag. Don't leave the altar until somebody speaks with you one-on-one -on -one and prays with you. And just tell them straight, workers, come on, tell them straight exactly why you came.
And don't be ashamed of it. They'll pray with you. And as soon as they're done, we'll begin to lay hands on everyone for a fresh touch of God. God bless you. God's meeting you tonight. He's going to give you all the help that you need. On this side of the sanctuary, if you have not been spoken to, please raise your hand on this side of the sanctuary. Please be patient, folks. We have a very large altar call this evening.
on this side of the sanctuary. If you have not been spoken to, please raise your hand. If you have not been spoken to this side of the sanctuary, please raise your hand real high so we can identify you. Please be patient. In front of, the sanct uh, front of the pulpit, please raise your hand if you have not been spoken to. Real high. Prayer team members, please make yourself available so we can reassign you. Ladies, raise your hand, this area, ladies. Raise your hand again, men, any men? Anyone else that has not been spoken, please raise your hand. If you have not been spoken to, please raise your hand. Anyone else that has not been spoken to, please raise your hand if you have not been spoken to. Anyone else that has not been spoken to, please raise your hand. You have not been spoken to. Anyone else that has not been spoken to?
Okay, folks, listen up. We're going to the second phase of the altar service, and here's how it works. Those of you that are here tonight for the very first time, it's your first night in revival. We'd like to pray for you first, so get into the aisles. Just get up from where you're sitting and go right into the aisles and come down as far forward as you can. You can't get all the way down here. It's crowded. But just get in the aisles and come as far forward as you can. A couple of do's and don'ts. We're going to begin praying for you in a moment. We ask that you not come up on the steps or the platform. Stay on the main floor of the sanctuary. From this point forward in the service, the only people that will be praying for you are those with a red or a purple prayer team badge on or one of those of us you've seen on the platform. The pastors and spouses and staff members that have helped us thus far in the altar call, we release you now to be prayed for. We appreciate your help. So the only people that will be praying from here, here on will be those of us uh, from the church here in the prayer team. So uh, it's going to take us a few moments to get to you. So keep your minds on the Lord. There will be music on. And uh, if you'll just open your heart, God will begin to touch you right where you are. Be patient. And don't follow anybody around from one place to the other. It's crowded. And that complicates things considerably. Stay right where you are. And we'll come to you where you are. We'll be with you in just a few minutes. God bless you. Amen. 